Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand in the house tonight and begin our service. I don't know about any of y'all, but after I heard the message on Sunday morning, it really messed with me. It really got inside my soul that I know there's more out there, that I need to do more. I need to go further in His love. I need to go further in His presence. But I just want to ask anybody today, tonight in this place, is there anybody that has a need and you know that God is going to meet you, but you know you've got to get out and exercise just a little bit of faith and meet Him down here so that you can just build that relationship with Him and let Him work. I want to ask you tonight, if you have a need in the house, you know what your need is. You know what your desire is. You know what your story is. But so does he. But I want to ask you tonight, if you would just make your way down, show a little bit of faith in the house tonight. Just seek after him a little more tonight. Let's let there be a seriousness in the spirit tonight. Let's let there be just a holy uptake of our, of our needs to heaven tonight. So if you have a desire, if you have a need, don't be bashful. These altars are open. This time of prayer is open. He's here. He's ready to deliver. He's ready to heal. He's ready to set you free. So God, we want to just come to you tonight, Lord, just to, just to be with you for a little while, Lord. God, you know our needs, you know our desires, but we just want to dwell with you in this place for a little while, Lord, and just seek after you and pray for just a little bit. God, your house is called the house of prayer, Lord. I know we praise, I know we sing, I know that, that we just give you honor and glory in everything that we do, God. We're boisterous about our worship, Lord, but sometimes we just need to sit back and listen and just seek after you, Lord, and pray. God, I just want to pray that you would hear us tonight, Lord. God, I know there's somebody in here that's hungry. I know there's somebody in here that desires more of you, Lord. I know there's somebody in here that just wants to seek after you, God, and not let go until they get their blessing. Lord, I pray right now that there would be somebody that releases a little faith in this house tonight just to search you out, God, just so that they can know you a little better. Lord, we just want to pray that you would hear us tonight, Lord, and help us in this place tonight. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. Thank you for all that you've already done, Lord. Thank you for your blessings to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Show us your glory in water. 
spend time with him in prayer he doesn't ask a whole lot of, it, of us he really doesn't but whenever we decide we're going to set aside a time for him he shows up and he shows out and it's just amazing some of the things that he does and it's just because he loves us there's no other reason it's all out of love God is love and it's just crazy to think about that sometimes that the God we serve is so big yet he's so relationable with each and every one of us he's such a giving God and tonight we're going to give back just a little bit we've got many ways that we give here at the Riverbend Pentecostals and they're up there on the screen I would encourage you to give give like you mean it give like you like you want to see miracles happen. Give like you want to see the gospel spread into this world. Give like you want to see the mission accomplished that God has placed on our shoulders. Give like you mean it, church. And if you would pray this prayer with me. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. Now bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, 
rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen, church.
everybody would stretch a hand towards these kids and let's pray over them. God, we want to come to you right now, Lord, just to pray over Riverbend kids tonight, Lord. I pray that that you would just bless them, Lord, that you would help instill something in them, Lord, that they're going to be able to take with them forever, God. Lord, I pray that you would just help them to be able to understand the word, to understand the message that they're going to be taught tonight and how to apply it to their lives. God, I pray that we've got a generation right here that's going to be strong for you, Lord. They're going to be warriors for you. God, I just pray that you would keep your hand on them, Lord. I pray that, that they would be safe everywhere that they go, that there would be a hedge put around them. Lord, that the enemy can't touch them. God, I just want to pray that you would just have your way with these kids tonight, Lord. And I thank you for everything that you do for them, Lord. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, Cole, lead them back. River Bend ignited. Y'all can come on up. there's already been a foundation laid of the word of the gospel, Lord. And I pray that with this group, we can just keep on building, Lord. God, that we can lay building blocks of faith with this age group, Lord, that they're going to be equipped, that they're going to be ready for whenever it's time to, to go out into the world, Lord. They're going to know who you are, Lord. They're going to know your love. They're going to know your safety, Lord, that, that there is whenever we just come to you, Lord. God, I pray that you would just bless this group tonight, Lord. I pray that that we could understand the word. I pray that we would get it, Lord. I pray that, that you would just help us tonight in class tonight. Just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to let everybody else know. You got to brag on somebody just a little bit. But Brother Derek is going to be our new distraction police. But no, he he did something earlier, and I've, I've seen Brother Kevin do it too. But both of these men have been putting their cell phone up here on the platform before church starts. And Brother Derek came to me. I, I seen him. I said, man, what are you doing? He said, I, I need a basket that says, like, cell phone basket or something. I said, well, I've got one of them. I've got it back there in the classroom. And he asked me if he could borrow it, and he, he set it right up here. It looks funny sitting there, but that's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of growth that, that there's somebody, some bodies that want to get everything they can out of the services whenever they show up. They want to soak in the word and not be distracted by something that they know is going to get their attention. So, Brother Derek, thank you for being an example. Brother Kevin, thank you for being an example for what it is to set things aside to make room for God. So we want to thank our pastor for what he's got tonight and welcome him to the pulpit. So y'all preach with him tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. While they're handing out the, tonight's handout, um, I, uh, I'm really enjoying this, uh, preparing for this series and, uh, Sometimes, like tonight, uh, I feel like it's going to start a little slow, but uh, I, uh, I'll tell you what I just felt right then while Brother Richard was talking, is I felt some people saying, mine ain't never going up there. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I don't, I don't throw my weight around and all that stuff, but I'm telling you right now, if you can't stay off of it while church is going on, you need it to be up there. Some people say, well, well, what if somebody needs me? What if they needed you 20 years ago? They should know where you are on Wednesday night. Huh? They should know where you are on Wednesdays. Here's what they used to do. They stuck their head back there and they got somebody's attention and said, go get Sister Stacy and tell her I need her. But the truth is, it didn't happen about once a year, if that often. That's right. 
Y'all know we ain't here very much out of the week, don't you? Well, some of us ain't here very much. Some of us are here all the time. And that's a good thing. Do we have enough? That's what I'm talking about. I got nervous as I started this. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, my faith is growing, not diminishing. But <clears throat> um, when you sign up to work for the kingdom of God, you are saying to God, I am willing to be inconvenienced. Sister Crystal believes it. Sister Rita half believes it. And Brother Shannon believes it. And I only say Sister Rita half believes it because Sister Crystal said, like, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, go on and preach it, brother. And Sister Rita said, yep. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Right after Aaron passed, I had people lined up telling me they wanted to help with kids' ministry. We've lost two. That's how it works. We've had two decide they don't want to anymore. Fine, whatever. But it ain't supposed to work in that direction. So what the devil tells me is, well, you started teaching on the fear of the Lord, and it's working. Stupid. But I forgot, Sister Maria, that I did say when I started this, you might lose some because of it. Because it will not be your everyday church of your whole life. God is not calling people to diminish. He's calling you to be challenged. That's what this is, is a challenge. Can I get an amen? Amen. I need to be challenged. I want to be challenged. The world has got enough assissified people who don't ever change, don't ever grow, don't ever get challenged, don't ever want to work harder. I don't want to be like that. And sometimes that's my nature. Put it in on cruise control, and I don't really want nobody messing with it. Woo. He's making me put my money where my mouth is. I made a pledge not to tell it, but I tell you right now, the Lord's doing things in my life that ain't never happened before. Amen. And I ain't the only one. Man's greatest failure. Don't get nervous. Please don't get nervous. We ain't going to be nervous. There's more people that love me than hate me. I know what the score is. If I come in and it's the other way, I'm going to get up here and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> no, nah, I'm not going to do that either. We'll just go to Tasters. Man's greatest failure, and it's in the church still, is worshiping and valuing our idea of God. They were taught of him. They looked for him, but when he came, they missed him because they were blinded by their own idea of the Messiah which conflicted with who he actually was and more than that, who he desired to be. Can he violate your comfort zone? Can he violate your idea of what it means to be a Christian? Be careful what you say. He'll ask, he'll make you, he'll make you prove it. Okay. Can he violate our idea about who he is and what he wants for us? I don't believe God demands that. I'm going to preach. When I get through preaching tonight, you're going to realize we ain't got a clue in the world what God wants to demand out of us. What, and it's not that he necessarily wants to demand it. He just knows it's in you. And if you don't get, allow him to challenge you, it ain't never coming out. They then changed the glory of the incorruptible God. It began in the garden when the devil said, "You just the Lord don't want you to be like him. 
Do you not find it ironic, Brother Cody, that ultimately Jesus came so I could be like him? That's what he came for, so I could become like him? But whoo, but it started in the garden when people wanted to do it their way. They wanted to do it a shortcut way. They wanted to do it any way they accept his way. We're still living in that same stuff. Okay. It showed up in Mount Sinai when Moses stayed gone too long. How do they know he stayed gone too long? They ain't never been there before. The law had been never been given out by heaven before, written down on tablets of stone by the finger of God before. How did they know it was too long? They just got tired of waiting. They just got tired of waiting. We find that it's still active in the New Testament church, Romans chapter number 1. They were talking about those images they made and those idols they made. And we found that, the, that the, they, they, they changed from the idols and image to the worship of who? Themselves. There you go. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And so when we worship and serve the images we have created, it results in a failure to be able to think productively and they lost their ability to be aware of God. Think about this just for a minute. If you want to worship a stump, God will let you. That's what happened. But the only problem they found, Brother Shannon, is when they started worshiping the stump, the stump didn't answer. He didn't receive their sacrifices. He didn't receive their worship. Nothing changed in their life when they were worshiping a stump or a fish or a billy goat or a, a, a mountain lion or a fish. It shows up powerfully in the nearly total loss of respect for authority from the smallest child to the eldest adult. We don't want nobody telling us what to do. You just well say right, because it's the truth. The result of not having to respect anybody's authority. And let me tell you something. If you go to this church, you call this your church, you better back up the teacher, you better back up the doctor, and you better back up the preacher, and you better back up the Sunday school teacher. Ain't all of us like it still yet, but you're wrong. You're wrong. You better respect the president even if you didn't vote for him. That's what the book says. You better pray for him. That's what the book says. All of a sudden, we don't like it now. Let me tell you, the closer you grow to the Lord, Brother Shannon, the more things you're going to find out you didn't like, but when you do it, all of a sudden, you love it because it works, it's right. His way is perfect. It's not just a good idea, it's a perfect way. And when you don't believe anybody is, can be trusted, you don't believe the Lord can be trusted either. And the reason why we don't trust anybody or the Lord is by and large because we've continually validated selfishness and self-centeredness in which universe God doesn't even exist except to be your judge. When we elevate self, I don't care what everybody in the whole world is saying about you and your parenting skills. Don't raise your kids to satisfy the world. They're going to spread their wings. They're going to do some stupid things. You did too. But you better hope you get something in them that the word backs up that says train them up the way they should go and when they're old it won't depart from them. They won't forget where their help is. All right. So let's bring God's greatness into perspective. Everybody all right? All right. Pastor ain't mad except at the devil. That sorry sucker's caused a whole lot of us to live beneath our privilege for the kingdom of God. And what I'm fixing to unpack tonight, I've never fully realized it. 
I don't even know if John Bevere fully realized it when he was writing that book of what he was turning loose. Because I'm going to mess with this a little bit. Bringing God's greatness into perspective. Let's talk about desiring and pursuing the greatness of his glory. Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, we're going to talk about the never-ending praise of the angels. They just sang about it, by the way. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train, that's the, the end of his robe, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, that's angels. Each one of these had six wings. With two of them he covered his face, and with two of them he covered his feet, and with two of them he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Does anybody see something powerful in that passage in the verse number three? Somebody said it, half of it. They cried one to another. What in the world's that got to do with anything? Well, here's what I see. I see that their praises aren't just for the benefit of God, but for the exhortation of one another. And one cried unto another and said, holy, holy. They were testifying to each other in praise and glory. And they've been singing this song since creation. And it's still being sung at the birth of Jesus. And it's going to be sung until the blood-bought, born-again believers are caught away from this corruptible world into the new heaven and the new earth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Look here what we do. We struggle with not singing the old songs or singing too many of the new songs which I found out the new songs don't stay new very long. And we generally respond in worship according to how many of our preferences are being met. Where do you see that in the angels? The reason is, Brother Shannon, it ain't got nothing to do with the song. It's got to do with their attitude about whose presence they're in. If you've belly ached and complained, I ain't, I ain't damning and condemning you because you ain't by yourself. We don't see the angels getting tired of singing the same old song. Why? Because they see who they're singing about. They're aware of who they're singing about. They're not at a cotton-picking concert. They're aware of him. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of the Holy Ghost is in this room. Jesus is here. We've got to be aware of him. And when they start singing anything that magnifies him, we better get on board. Say, I don't know the words. That dog don't hunt them words is up there on every song. Say, I don't know the tune. I ain't been in tune since Moby Dick was a sardine. I sing in every other key than the ones that's on the piano. Y'all know that by now. Sound like a sick moose. But I'm telling you the power of the Holy Ghost, Brother Shannon, when I start singing some of them songs, that one song, I, I'd, I'd wish they'd sing it every service, but then nobody would worship. But when it says, my praise, I will sing into the night, my praise will cause the sun to rise, boy, that does something on the inside of me and the power of my praise and in the middle of my mess, and I can feel it. The angels don't get tired of singing the same old song because they see him. 
The psalmist refers to this blessings and pleasure and glory as the unsearchable riches of God, which I got to confess, when I've read it that he said the unsearchable riches, I just assumed that it meant that you can't find it. Try hard, but you're not going to get there. Unsearchable. Is that a fair assumption? Huh? It in no way denotes that you can't find it. It's not talking about since they're unsearchable, don't even try. But it's talking about, here we go, Brother Shannon. I'm just going to keep referring to Brother Shannon because this is happening in his life right now. The reason I know is he texts me about it all day long. I hope his boss ain't watching. You know what the unsearchable riches of God are? It's just about the time you learn something about him, he shows up with something new about him. The reason why it's unsearchable is you ain't never going to figure it all out. You're never going to feel all his blessings. You're never going to feel all of his power. You're never going to feel everything he's got to give. You're never going to know everything he's got to know because as soon as you find something new, he's ready to reveal something else because there's no end to him. The end is found in us and we need to give up on the end and grasp a hold of the newness. What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? I was hoping you would ask. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Get this. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's a beautiful thing and it's powerful. And when I feel it, Sister Dana, I know what I'm feeling. But when I begin to let it happen, he takes me places I ain't never been. He lets me experience things I've never experienced. And he's starting to use people in ways he's never used them because they yield their self to him. And it's brand new. Am I in a Pentecostal church? I'm probably busting somebody's bubble, but I got a text message today from somebody and they started it out with this. I have never laid hands on anybody out of my house and prayed for them before. Till this week. Oh, it gets better. And I prayed for somebody that I'd come in contact with. And they called me about three hours later and they weren't sick no more. And they said, there was power in them prayers you prayed. It's new. It's new. It's more of God. And I would say that the hardest thing that we're figuring out about God is how much he wants to use us. That's why it's unsearchable. Because just when you think you've arrived, there's more. Brother Ronnie, he just ain't been around here very long. He's not feeling good tonight. That's why he's not here. He's, he's kind of sick. But he raised his hand over at Parma, whatever day we were over there, Saturday. Is that right? He raised his hand, and he was just super excited. He thought he was the new kid on the block, you know, and he said, boy, I ain't never been a part of nothing like this. Surprise. Ain't none of the rest of us either. Really, it's new. But you know what I found out, Brother Austin? New, new is life. Old is stagnant. It only takes in. Ah, it only takes in. It's just nothing but a glorified mud hole that just takes in water. And it's like an old cistern. Remember that? The Bible talks about it. You just take in and you just take in. But when it don't rain, you get funky and stagnant and nasty. But when it's coming in and going out, it's clear and it's fresh and it's pretty and it's alive. Ain't no dead living in it. That's what stagnant is, is everything in it died because no air came to it. Oh, man. Would we yawn, zone out, be distracted, and God have mercy on us, fall asleep in church if we were as aware of him as the angels are? Would we be checking to see if we got a message from somebody out there and miss out on a message from heaven? 
if we were really aware of him. Like the angels are. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. As soon as I read that, I was smote in my spirit because I realized something. First Peter chapter 1 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. If you ain't never read it, you need to. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 12, around verse number 12, but in specific verse number 12, we learn that this incredible witness of the Spirit with which we are baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, is designed to empower us to persevere through anything and everything until we're truly saved by being caught up to heaven to be with the Lord. Verse 12 up there? Do you have verse 12 too put up there? Don't worry, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know what the end of verse number 12 says? Which things the angels desire to look into. They want to know about it. Think about this now. Look at here. How can we let a being, a created being, who has never known what it means to be redeemed, every angel that you know of that sinned is reserved in everlasting chains until the day of judgment. The devil in one third, kicked out. Book of Jude says they're reserved in everlasting chains. There has never been an angel mess up and get brought back. How can we let somebody who doesn't know anything about being redeemed stay more consistent and honest in their worship than those of us who have failed and have fallen and experienced the power of God's infinite mercy and grace in being restored. No angel has ever been redeemed. When the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, there's only one person that can speak up, and that's humanity. We're the only ones who have been bought back. We're the only ones who have been renewed and refreshed and restored in the power of the Holy Ghost. We're the only ones who've had our sins forgotten. Amen. Nobody can answer that but us. If we get what I'm teaching, we'll have to calm people down to preach the word. We'll have to calm people down to take up the offering. If we fully get aware, why do you think David said, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and I will enter his courts with praise because he knew where he was going and he knew who was going to meet him there. Boy, I'm working way too hard, I think. What'd you say, brother? That's what I'm talking about. When we praise, when we sing, when we come together, it's not just praise. It's not just a song. It is an acknowledgement of that incomparable God, the only God, the only true powerful God. And when I praise him and when I worship him and when I sing about him, I'm doing it based upon what I know about him. It doesn't yet reflect what I don't know about him. But it's being revealed to me every day. You want to know why this is the day the Lord has made? I will rejoice and be glad in it. You want to know why that every morning we get up and it's a new day? It's because we're experiencing the refreshing power of God. Amen. And we can't wait to get to the sanctuary to share it with everybody else. Amen. Sister Leanne, I told us that day was coming. I don't know if you remember it or not. But I said, it's going to be a beautiful thing when Sundays we show up to celebrate what God's been doing in our life all week long. Huh? We just about there. And you want to know something, Brother Brenton? There's a whole lot of folks that sit back and say, what are they acting all crazy for? I don't feel nothing. Let me tell you who's acting crazy. The ones who's letting crazy out of them 
when they ain't in the church house. The ones who don't mind letting people know. The ones that wouldn't talk in church for the first six months they were here. Wouldn't clap, wouldn't raise their hands, but Saturday they was knocking on doors and inviting people to recovery. Huh? Here's what needs to rise up when you hear that. Instead of big whoop, criticizing, I know what they've been doing anyway. They was lying or they cussed or they slipped up and did something. Instead, celebrate it and say, God, I want some of that. Because if you're so cotton-picking holy, you ought to be on the front of the line anyway. Zippity-doo-dah, zippity-day. My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine. Just trying to encourage myself in the Lord. I get to come here and praise him with us. And I don't know about, I have some incredible blessings by myself. The power of the Holy Ghost moves and he's been waking me up all hours of the night and the presence of the Lord is just as strong every hour of the night as he is anywhere else. But there's something special about coming with a whole lot of other folks that are learning about him and knowing about him and we begin to lift our hands together and we begin to clap our hands together and we begin to sing the praises of God together. There's something powerful about it. Beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Hold up a minute. You got to get in the microphone. So especially since you started off, I think it's going to be good. <laughs> a guest that's been coming recently, she told me last week, she said, I guess I never realized that there are people in the church that don't ever move or worship. She said, because I always sit up front, but why in the world would they not want to? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that in just a minute. People that don't surrender like they have in the past, they're really not doing it just to be mean or mad. There's something lost. There's something diminished. Look at here. What I don't know about him is way more than what I do know about him. And every day he's showing me new mercy, new grace, new compassion, new giftings, new faith. Every morning, and I get to come here and praise him with us. If they sing anything that reminds me of the God I know, or better yet, the one I want to know. I said, if they sing something that reminds me of the God I want to know, let it be said that I acknowledge him to the fullest capacity of my ability if my awareness of him is diminished then I cannot worship him in spirit and truth say well I think I don't think you got to do this and I don't think you got to do that there, there ain't nothing the only thing we know for sure clap your hands make a joyful noise dance leap play the instruments High symbols, do it loudly. It's in the book. And sometimes, sometimes you meditate on the presence of God. It's not always hooping, hollering, yelling, and running. It's not. But when it rises up in you, wait a minute. I ain't got no right to be here. I better act like I know where I am in case he decides that I don't realize what he's done for me. The necessity of the continual newness of God is if I'm not learning something new about him, 
It's because I stopped looking. Remember Sunday? Brother Richard does. He talked about it. The message was there is more. What does that look like to you? What does that look like to you? What does that look like to me? The Bible says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The only way to not get more from him is don't want more. So let's listen to what the whole world's saying, the universe, the message of the universe. Psalms 145. I think Sister Heidi told me I may have some scriptures wrong on your handout. If I do, it's the copier's fault. No, it's my fault. But you may have to solve the puzzle by finding more. It says, all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. Are we one of his works? But it looks to me like there's a special section for the saints of God. Huh? They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. All of creation sings and praises him continually and consistently. Isaiah 40 and 12 tells us who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. The oceans, they started out here. Rivers, streams, creeks, trickles, they all started in the hand of God. Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens. That's the span from here to here. When you read in the measurement in the Bible about a span, this is how they got it. It was from the tip, tip of the thumb to the tip of the pinky. He marked off the heavens with the breadth of his hand. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance. Every river, stream, ocean, and sea has been, it started out in the palm of his hand. The heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the galaxies laid out and measured, ordered with the breadth of his hand. He's held every bit of the dirt in the world in a basket. And he knows the weight of every mountain and hill. He's a big God. The heavens declare his glory. Psalms, I, I think this might be where I messed up, but I don't know for sure. Psalms 19, 1 through 4, the New Living Translation says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Can I get an amen? amen. Nothing more beautiful than the vibrant colors with which God painted the earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. How exactly is that, that they declare the glory of God? They stay right where he put, him, put them. They submit themselves to his word. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, Well, I don't want to get controversial, but I'm going to just a wee, wee, wee little bit all the way home. <laughs> day after day, they pour forth speech. That's the heavens, the skies, the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the clouds, all that that's above us. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice 
goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. You know how long the sun's going to keep shining and the moon's going to keep popping out? And you know how long the glaciers are going to stay where the glaciers are? And you know how long that there's going to keep on being planting and going to keep on being harvesting? And you're going to know how long that the heavens and the sky are going to keep preaching about the goodness and the mercy of God? As long as he wants them to. Man doesn't have the power to destroy what God put out there. And he commanded it to stay until the ends of the world. That doesn't mean we need to mistreat this world we've been given. If you're a litter bug, you need to stop. If you clean your truck out driving down the road, you need to stop. Take care of this earth the Lord gave us. But the, the message of the world is going to keep being preached until the end. The sun is 93 million miles from earth. It would take 21 years of nonstop flying on a jumbo jet to reach the sun. 21 years, no stops for gas, no stops for food, nonstop flying for 365 days a year for 21 years to fly an airplane to the sun. It would take 200 years to drive an automobile to the moon, or excuse me, to the sun. The moon is 239,000 miles from earth. It would take 19 days of nonstop flying on a plane to reach the moon. 21 years to the sun, 19 days to the moon. After the sun, the next closest star that you see out there in the night sky is 4.3 light years away. Now what's a light year? Light travels just over 160,000 miles per second, okay? A light year with light traveling 186,000 miles per second is how far light travels in a full year. 186,000 miles per second in a full year. That's roughly... 670 million miles an hour. And it takes 4.3 of our years at that speed for us to see the light from that star here on earth when it started. It would take 51 billion years to, apply, to fly a plane 4.3 light years. There are some stars that are 4,000 light years away from us. It would take light 4,000 years to make it that far, traveling at 186,000 miles per second. 4,000 years. There are stars that we can see that their light started toward us before Moses parted the Red Sea. The furthest man has ever seen, even with a telescope, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, is 13.2 billion light years from us. Our minds can't comprehend it. But listen to what Psalms 147 is. Is this the one I messed up? Okay. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. The infinite God. He counts the stars and calls them by name. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. Let me keep moving and I'll get done. Let's talk about his glorious wisdom revealed in creation, Jeremiah 10 and 12. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. 
It's all out there where God put it. It's all out there because God spoke it into existence. God's designs and building blocks remain a marvel to science. They can't understand it and they can't comprehend it. Here's why. All matter is made up of cells. Y'all heard, y'all remember, y'all learned that in like seventh grade biology or science class. <laughs> cells are made up of molecules, elements, and then atoms. And atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons all running around in the nucleus of the atom. And it's impossible to see an atom with the naked eye. Who holds it all together? What holds it all together? Scientists say they gave it a name, atomic energy. But guess what? They don't know where it came from. True. They don't know where atomic energy came from. But the Bible tells us where it came from. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, talking about Jesus, upholding means to carry along until, until either a temporary or a permanent conclusion. That means that everything in the entire universe was put there by the word of God. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to let you know what this means because I've already seen I'm losing some folks. I know you worked hard today. Now you're resting and I'm working hard now. <laughs> Colossians 1 and 17 in the New Living Translation says, He existed before anything else and He holds all creation together. Amen. How big it is. We just talked about it. We, we really can't fathom how big it is. I'm sorry. This was good when I studied it. But you know what we're doing right now? Exactly what I talked about not doing. Some of us are zoning out. Say, well, I'm tired. I don't, I don't know if that works because, Brother Cody, I told him he could wake me up in the middle of the night, and guess what? He did. He did. And you know what I found out, Brother Shannon? When I keep my end of the deal, he met me there. He met me there. We got to get a different acknowledgement and recognition of who he is. I'm not, I'm not damning and condemning anybody. I know we're tired. I know we work hard and all of that. But if you happen to go watch Disney on ice on Wednesday night, you don't fall asleep. Or if you go home after Wednesday night church and turn on the housewives, you got to stay awake till you find out who ends up with who. Or you lose the, the flow of the, of, the, of the show or whatever it's called. I, I'm serious. Have you, you, you sit here. I've sat here before. I've sat here in church and thought, boy, as soon as I walk in the door, I'm shucking my britches. And I'm going to bed. But you know what happened on the way home, Sister Crystal? I forgot all about that. I forgot all about that because then I got hungry and I got thirsty and I had to check up on who watched church on Facebook. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. I felt convicted when I began to read this because I had sat right over there when one of these other guys is preaching and felt like I needed to do this. Feel convicted. The problem is, is I, I've lost my awareness of him. If we're sitting here like a bump on a log and somebody comes in and says one of your babies just had a wreck, you're going to wake up. It's an awareness Hey, if I'm so boring, we got to go to sleep. 
to just lay down on the thing and go to sleep. I ain't quitting. <laughs> he keeps it all together. And it does it just at his word. Let me hurry. So then he says in Psalms chapter 8, verse 3 through 4, we're talking about the bigness of the universe. Here, here we go. And the smallness of man. When we take a look at how big the world is and how big the universe is, and then we serve a God who's big enough to put it all together and make it work for however many years it's been out there. It's always worked. And then the psalmist said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, the human beings that you care for them? Psalm 139, I may quit with this. No, I, I got one more little thing. Psalms 139, 17 and 18. I, I feel like I got a powerful revelation when I read this. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And when I awake, I am still with thee. It kind of didn't make sense to me until I started unpacking it and studying it, thinking about it and praying about it. And I read, he said, how precious, heavy, weighty, or of great magnitude are rare. How precious are the thoughts of God unto me. It says that it's not your average run-of-the-mill thoughts that he has toward his other works, but the thoughts he has toward us are precious. They're heavy, they're weighty, they're of a great magnitude, they're rare. It says how great. That word means vast and far-reaching they are. They are of greater number than the grains of sand. Ladies and gentlemen, he doesn't have to think about Jupiter, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and Saturn, and Pluto, and all them other ones. You want to know why? They have no choice. They stay where he put them because they have no choice. But the ones he's thinking of all the time are the only created being that can choose Try to grasp the magnitude of this being personal to all of the nearly 8 billion people who are on the face of the earth. That's where his thoughts stay focused. As opposed to making sure this other stuff stays in place, he doesn't have to work at that. But he has to constantly stay on us. They stay because he gave the word for them too. Us, on the other hand, the creation with the power to choose the unlimited opportunities. Let's just say maybe the things you dream about doing for God. Has anybody in here ever had dreams of doing something for God? I'm bringing it home. I'm bringing it home. I ain't blind. I can see what's going on. Has anybody not ever had a dream about doing anything for God? You're just happy to be here like many pearl? Sister Naomi Thatcher, she's what she always says. I'm just so proud to be here like Minnie Pearl. What are you dreaming about? You know what I realized, Brother Blake? Is that scripture up there? You know what I realized that saying, Brother Shannon? Is the things I dream about when I woke up, they're still real. It's not just something that's in a dream anymore of when I'm asleep, but it has now become my reality because I recognize how big he really is. I recognize how powerful he really is, but that he thinks about me. When the psalmist woke up, nothing had changed. That which was formerly confined to the dreams of my sleep has now become reality. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions, they fail not. 
as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Stand with us, if you would. Okay. Okay, we will. Let's pray for Sister Sharon right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your healing power, your mercy, your grace. I pray that it's manifested in her body. You are a healer. We just taught that you're a great big God. You hold everything in, in control out there. I pray that you do the same right here. I pray, God, that your mercy and your grace are manifest in her. Let healing power be loosed into her body right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Amen and amen and amen. Do we have any announcements? Do what? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I've been thinking of it all day. Saturday here at the church, Sister Erlene Moore, that's Sister Peaches' mother. How many remember when she came to church here with us before she had to go to the nursing home? She rode a, she rode a scooter all over town all over everywhere. She was paralyzed, but yet she still came to church as long as she could. She's passed away, and the service will be here at church. The visitation's at 10. The funeral is at 11. And uh, so we want to make sure that everybody knows about that. And uh, they said this was her church, and she had done requested that I preach her funeral. They got all kinds of preachers in their family, but she said she wanted me to preach her funeral. She wanted to have it here at this church, and so we're going to do that. Amen. 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 And uh, 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 Sister Judy and her team will be doing a meal for the family. And uh, we're going to need some help over the next couple of days getting everything ready. And uh, we'll be talking to some of you, but we need you to be available to help. Did this click tonight? As big as he is, we're the ones on his mind. Fear of God, the fear of the Lord. When you realize that, Brother Shannon, how can we not respect Him to the nth degree? And then I see the evidence of it all around us. Sunday morning, 10 o'clock will be elements, 11 o'clock will be our service. But, uh, Please don't forget about the funeral here Saturday. If you're able to come, please do that. Sister Peaches and Brother Walter would appreciate it. I'm so very sure. And uh, uh, thank everybody for what you'll do to help us. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word, your promises. Thank you for truth and the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe in you, God, and I trust you. I thank God you're going to do great things. I pray, Lord, that you will minister. Keep everybody safe going home. Pray for Sister Sharon again and all those that are sick and unable to be here tonight. Keep us and bring us back in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.